Welcome back to the Art of Climate Modeling. Today we'll be finishing off our discussion on time integrators. Last time we contextualized the relevance of time integration and laid out some of the simplest, explicit, and implicit in time integration schemes. This time we'll be looking at more advanced methods for discretizing that time derivative operator, then turn our attention to Lagrangian and semi-Lagrangian methods, and wrap up with a discussion of numerical stability. So let's begin. Last time we introduced the explicit forward Euler method and implicit backward Euler method. Both of these schemes were shown to be first order methods, meaning that they only obtained the exact solution when the forcing function was constant. We then noted that first order accuracy was largely insufficient for atmospheric modeling, and schemes of at least second order in time are needed. This motivated our first second order method, the leapfrog scheme, which used multiple time levels to obtain second order accuracy. However, we also noted that this scheme laid, led to checkerboarding in time, and so required additional off-centering or smoothing in order to obtain a reasonable solution. Consequently, improved methods have been sought. Runge-Kutta methods are a class of methods capable of attaining higher order accuracy in time within each time step. They do so by evaluating the time tendency at multiple points within the time step, then using that information to estimate the integrated time tendency. Methods of this type are known as multi-stage methods. Although they do not require storing of data from previous time steps, additional data storage may be needed for data calculated during the time step. Our first example of a Runge-Kutta method is the second-order accurate predictor-corrector method. Recall that second order in this case means that the method will be exact for both a constant and a linear time tendency f. When employed, this method first calculates a first-order approximation to qj at time n plus 1 as part of the prediction step. Observe that this approach is identical to the forward Euler method. We denote that value with a superscript asterisk, as it is not our final estimate of the state at time n plus 1. With the prediction in hand, we then apply a correction to the predictor as follows. First, we estimate the state halfway through the time step as the average of the initial state and the predicted state. Second, we apply a half a time step using the time tendency evaluated on the predicted state. The result of this two-part calculation then becomes our estimate of the state at time n plus 1. So what does this look like when we consider how we're integrating the time tendency? Well, if we substitute the expression for q star into the update equation for qn plus 1, we get the equation at the top of this slide. If we compare this to the integral form of the discrete update equation, we can see that the integral is being approximated by delta t times the average of the time tendency at the initial time and the estimate of the time tendency at time n plus 1. This is essentially the trapezoid rule for integrals, which is a second order method for integrating that effectively computes the blue shaded area shown in the diagram. Clearly, this method greatly improves upon our first few schemes. And further, it doesn't support a computational mode like the leapfrog method. There are hundreds of Runge-Kutta methods in use nowadays for solving different sets of partial differential equations. One of the most frequently applied in atmospheric science is the strong stability preserving third order Runge-Kutta method, or SSPRK3. Specifically, Runge-Kutta schemes are referred to as strong stability preserving if they have no negative coefficients. The third order scheme, perhaps unsurprisingly, requires three stages in order to achieve third order accuracy. And third order accuracy means that it is exact for a time tendency that is constant, linear, or quadratic. For SSPRK3, the first stage is again a forward Euler step. The second stage is three quarters of the initial guess plus one quarter of the first stage estimate plus a quarter time step forward. The third and final stage is one third of the initial state plus two thirds of the second stage state plus two thirds of a time step forward using the Q2 state. Again, substituting Q1 and Q2 into our final update, we obtain this expression for Qn plus one. Again, compared against the integral form of the update equation, we observe that the SSPRK3 method is, in essence, duplicating Simpson's rule for integration, which is well known, a well-known high-order method for computing integrals. Observe that this time integration scheme produces an estimate for the integral that is nearly visually indistinguishable from the curve itself, indicative of the accuracy of the method. As mentioned earlier, hundreds of different Runge-Kutta schemes are possible. The CAM spectral element dynamical core once modeled its update on the leapfrog scheme with a synchronization step at the end of the update. 
The result was a second order method with as many stages as needed. Because of the synchronization stage, this in essence turned the multi-step leapfrog scheme into a multi-stage method. While the checkerboarding could develop in between synchronizations, it does get removed at the synchronization stage. However, recent investigations of Rungakata methods with optimal stability regions has led to the adoption of a new time-stepping scheme in the spectral element dynamical core, based on the work of Kinmark and Gray from the early 1980s. The resulting scheme, while perhaps a bit odd-looking, can be shown to support the theoretically largest allowable time step for a third-order explicit method with five stages. It also doesn't possess checkerboarding effects like those possessed of the by the leapfrog schemes. In fully non-hydrostatic models, time step stability is often restricted by vertically propagating sound waves. These are particularly problematic because of the small vertical grid spacing. Recent work on additive Rungakata methods, or ARC methods for short, have enabled high-order coupled solutions of the non-hydrostatic equations without sacrificing time step size. This is done by isolating the terms in the partial differential equations responsible for vertical sound wave propagation, then using an appropriate ARC method to integrate in time. In essence, we can use an explicit method for the slow waves and an implicit method for the fast waves. One such ARC method is shown here although I should note that there are many dozens of these methods now out there in the literature. This method brackets an explicit SSPRK3 method, which handles the slow modes, with two half-time step implicit backward Euler steps, which handle the fast modes. As a result, the vertically propagating sound waves no longer limit the maximum time step size allowed by the time stepping method. At the same time, we gain the raw performance benefits of the explicit Rungakata method. Because the vertically propagating waves can be isolated to two coupled partial differential equations, the implicit solve can be implemented very efficiently. All right, that wraps up our discussion on Rungakata methods. Next, we're going to consider a completely different method for solving these equations in Lagrangian form, yielding a class of methods known as semi-Lagrangian methods. For simplicity, we're going to restrict our discussion to the advection equation, although the methods discussed here can also be applied to any, different, any partial differential equation in Lagrangian form with some modification. Remember, in the Lagrangian frame, we can describe the atmosphere from the perspective of fluid parcels that move about in space. An equation such as the one shown here, which indicates that the material derivative of a particular mixing ratio is equal to zero, is used to represent conservation of mass following the fluid parcel or more specifically, that the tracer mixing ratio is constant in the Lagrangian frame. To begin, let's consider semi-Lagrangian methods in the finite difference context. Remember that under finite differences, the data is discretized as points on a grid. Here, we've depicted a small region containing three rows and four columns of grid points, indexed as a two-dimensional array. In the Lagrangian context, we assume each of these grid points corresponds to a fluid parcel, and so allow them to move around in response to the winds. For a prescribed wind field, the position of the fluid parcel can be obtained by using the definition of the velocity field. Namely, the velocity is equal to the time rate of change of position with respect to time. Thus, the time rate of change of position with respect to time is equal to the velocity. By integrating this equation forward or backward in time, we can determine the future or historical position of each fluid parcel. If we integrate backward in time over a duration delta t, we obtain the position of the fluid parcel as it was at the previous time step. That is, under the uniform wind field depicted here, each of the red dashed circles indicate the position of the fluid parcel one time step earlier, while the blue circles represent the current positions of those fluid parcels. Over the course of the time step, the fluid parcels that are indicated by the red dashed lines will be advected or moved to match the positions of the blue fluid parcels. If we integrated backward in time all the way to the beginning of the simulation, then used the prescribed initial conditions to calculate the mixing ratio at each fluid parcel node, the result would be a fully Lagrangian method. However, this has numerous problems associated with it, including a tendency for fluid parcels to either bunch up or spread out over long time integrations. Instead, if we choose to interpolate to the red dashed position, we obtain a class of methods known as backward semi-Lagrangian methods. To recap, Let's assume we know the state of the field at the previous time step n minus 1 at all the blue grid point locations. We want to know the state of the field at the current time step n at these locations. 
but we also know the positions of these fluid parcels are linked via Lagrangian advection. So we integrate back in time from the current time step to obtain the fluid parcel locations at the previous time step, then interpolate the value of the mixing ratio from the known blue points at the previous time step to the red dashed circle locations, and advance that in time to its original grid point location. Semi-Lagrangian methods have the advantage of having no time step limit, as long as you can integrate the Lagrangian advection equation back far enough. However, in the formulation I presented here, it's very difficult to obtain conservation, although an appropriate mass fixer could help in that regard. Much like we recovered conservation in the Eulerian sense by moving from finite differences to finite volume methods, we can also recover conservation in the semi-Lagrangian context by moving from pointwise semi-Lagrangian methods to volumetric semi-Lagrangian methods. If we consider each fluid parcel to now cover a single grid cell, we can deform the corners of that grid cell using the same backtracking formula in, order, in terms of the wind vector. This is a natural way of thinking about advection of fluids, but it has a very clear caveat. If we integrate back too far in time, deformation of the grid can lead to some really severe problems in, in representing individual grid cells. Here we see a common deformation pattern that emerges from an atmospheric flow. So to limit the amount of deformation experienced by the fluid parcel, we instead use a semi-Lagrangian strategy. A forward semi-Lagrangian method would be one where the grid at the current time step is evolved in time to time n plus 1, then remapped to the standard reference grid. However, building a subgrid scale reconstruction of, on the deformed mesh can be difficult, and so it makes it more difficult to employ forward semi-Lagrangian methods. The backward semi-Lagrangian approach is thus preferable in this context. This requires simultaneously building a subgrid scale reconstruction on the grid at time n and calculating the de-evolved grid from time n plus 1 back to time n. Then the reconstructed field is regridded onto the deformed grid, which is then evolved back to its nice structured form. This is the approach employed by the conservative semi-Lagrangian multi-tracer or C-SLAM method, which is an option in CAM. Backward semi-Lagrangian transport schemes can be shown to be equivalent to another class of semi-Lagrangian methods known as flux form Lagrangian transport methods. These are much more like finite volume methods in the sense that we consider an Eulerian grid and want to compute fluxes across each edge of the grid. To compute those fluxes, we backtrack the corners of the edge in time, producing the orange swath shown here. We know that over the course of the time step, this orange swath will then pass through the edge, leading to a flux through that edge. So by integrating over the subgrid scale reconstructions in that region, we can obtain an estimate for the flux passing through that edge. To see how these schemes work in practice, it is common to employ a suite of advection tests such as the deformational flow test shown here. In this case, an analytically specified velocity field has been chosen that will allow two blobs of tra tracer mass to deform before returning to their original position. By computing the difference between the final tracer distribution and the initial distribution, we can estimate the error introduced by the advection scheme. Now that we've talked about spatial discretizations and temporal discretizations, we're set up to talk about model stability. So far, we've posed two questions. The first, related to spatial discretizations is, how do we best represent continuous data when only a very limited amount of information can be stored? The second, related to temporal discretizations, is how do we best represent the dynamic evolution of the atmosphere? What I would like to emphasize is that these two questions are inherently linked to one another. Your choice of spatial discretization does inform your options when it comes to temporal discretizations, and the temporal discretization can determine the performance of the spatial discretization. The choice of spatial and temporal discretizations cannot really be made separately. A failure to recognize the connection between the spatial discretization and the temporal discretization can easily result in the manifestation of instability. Instability shows up in many ways, sometimes subtle, but often not. Perhaps most commonly, instability in a global atmospheric dynamical core manifests in the appearance of checkerboarding or an unphysical enhancement of the shortest wave modes. The plot here shows an obvious example of model instability, which resulted from choosing a time step size that was simply too large for the chosen discretization.
In fact, it is exactly this kind of phenomenon that Richardson observed when he did his first attempts at a numerical weather forecast in the early 1900s. Instability is generally studied in the linear context, where a deep theory has been developed related to how it manifests. However, nonlinear instabilities also exist and are often far more difficult to analyze. In this class, we'll only talk about linear stability, as it's the primary factor in determining the maximum time step size of a numerical method. Our starting point will be a linear update equation like the one shown here in the top right. Basically, we are assuming that there is some linear combination of elements of Qn such that, when combined, give Qn plus 1. If our problem is nonlinear, such as in the case of a discretization applied to the atmospheric fluid equations, then we can linearize the system by assuming small perturbations about a reference state, and then analyze the resulting uh, system for stability. By construction, B is a square matrix. From linear algebra, we know that if the matrix B is well behaved, then it possesses a set of eigenvectors, one eigenvector for each row of the matrix. These eigenvectors are the modes of the discretization, and for wave modes that are well represented by the discretization, correspond to the wave modes we discussed in the context of the spectral transform method. Each of these wave modes then has a corresponding eigenvalue, which is the scalar enhancement of the magnitude of the wave mode under the application of the matrix B. Since we have as many eigenvectors as degrees of freedom in the problem, we can uniquely decompose any vector Q into a linear combination of these wave modes. Substituting this expression into the update equation and applying the properties of eigenvectors yields the expression at the bottom of this slide. Then comparing this formula against the linear expansion at time n plus 1 reveals a multiplicative relationship between the wave mode coefficients at time n plus 1 and those at time n. Namely, we find that the new coefficient a n plus 1 equals the eigenvalue of this mode times the old coefficient value a n. Physically, this means that each wave mode will experience a phase shift and an amplification which is determined by the eigenvalue lambda i. If we are interested only in the effect of the linear update equation on the magnitude of the wave mode, we only need to take the absolute value of both sides of this expression. Thus, we end up with three cases relevant to the amplification of this wave mode. Either lambda i is less than 1, greater than 1, or equal to 1. The case of lambda i greater than 1 is the most problematic, corresponding to a wave mode that grows exponentially in time. In effect, the numerical discretization is putting energy into this wave mode that can drive its amplification. Wave modes that grow too large can trigger unphysical effects such as negative density, which in turn cause the model to fail. The case of lambda less than 1 is associated with a loss of energy from this wave mode. The resulting discretization is stable, in the sense of energy remaining, remaining bounded, and no unphysical conditions being generated. However, the loss of energy may be undesirable over long simulations, and may need to be replaced with an energy fixer, or a spectral backscatter scheme. The case of lambda i equal to 1 indicates that this wave does not amplify with time, instead maintaining its amplitude. This could be associated with a propagating wave that retains a continuous amplitude, and is the most desirable case when the partial differential equation has an energy conservation property. The discussion so far has been very theoretical and would benefit from a specific example. So let's consider the simplest example, the forward Euler method in time plus upwinding in space from our discussion of finite difference methods. The update equation for this method looks like the first equation at the top left. Observe that the non-dimensional constant u times delta t divided by delta x appears in this equation, which we define here as nu. This constant is essentially ubiquitous in the study of numerical methods and is given the name the Courant number, after researcher Richard Courant. Over a given number of degrees of freedom, the linear update equation for this particular combination of methods is given on the middle of this slide. Notice that the diagonal is exclusively 1 minus nu, while the lower off diagonal is always new. When periodic boundary conditions are enforced, we also get a new in the upper right corner of the matrix. It can be shown that the eigenvectors of this matrix all have the same form, namely complex exponentials with argument i times j times k, where i is the square root of negative 1, j is the coordinate index, and k is the wave number. The corresponding eigenvalues for wave number k are 1 minus nu, 
times 1 plus the exponent of negative i k. Taking the squared absolute value of each eigenvalue yields the expression shown here. Since cos of k only takes on values between negative 1 and 1, we can argue that the maximum eigenvalue in each case is obtained when cos k is equal to negative 1. Thus, the largest eigenvalue among all eigenvalues of this matrix is 1 plus 4 times nu times nu minus 1. If we plot this curve for all values nu, we find that the maximum eigenvalue has magnitude less than or equal to 1 only for values of nu between 0 and 1. That is, if delta t is larger than delta x over u, or if u is negative, this method is inherently unstable and will lead to at least one wave mode that grows without bound. This stability condition, for a given numerical method, is known as the CFL condition, after Richard Courant, Kurt Friedrichs, and Hans Liwi. Similar analysis can be conducted for other spatial and temporal discretizations to yield bounds on the maximum time step size and so determine the stability of these methods. Alright, that wraps up our discussion on temporal discretizations. In the next lecture, we'll be turning our attention to some of the choices and issues when it comes to vertical discretizations.